And good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us here tonight on King Jordan Radio. The date is December 3, 2015. Tonight on the show, we will get into Chicago police officer charged with first-degree murder. The sentencing for Jared, formerly with Subway, was that um, the right sentence, the wrong sentence? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Charlie Sheen. And uh, we will get into uh, MJ. And uh, we will take your calls at 347-857-2950. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a very special guest. He is a defense attorney uh, based out of the Los Angeles area. He does pro bono work a couple of times a year. He represented such stars as Mike Tyson, Robert Blake, Michael Jackson, um, and more. And he currently is representing Shug Knight. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure to have back on the show the one and only, the legendary, Tom Mesero. Good evening, Tom. Uh, welcome back to the King Jordan Radio Show. How are you? I'm doing fine, Jordan. Thank you for the uh, glowing introduction. Hope I can live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Before we uh, proceed, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the uh, shooting tragedy that happened over the last 48 hours uh, in your neck of the woods. Oh, it's just a just a tragedy. I'm just sick to my stomach listening to this and watching these people suffering, these families, these innocent people. It happened at a public facility that handled disabled children, and I don't, can't imagine what kind of sick minds would be behind this. But it's an absolute tragedy, and um, you know, it just uh, my heart goes out to all of these poor families who are suffering through this. Do you see any kind of answer for this uh, in terms of the gun laws? Well, you know, that's a tricky subject because uh, generally uh, I'm for gun control, but the question right. is would gun control have stopped something like this? Apparently the uh, the fellow who instigated it, uh, apparently with his wife, uh, had no criminal record, um, and had he wanted to purchase a gun legally, which I believe he did, uh, someone told me that. I heard it on the radio today, uh, or at least some of the guns are purchased legally. You know, he would have qualified. So it's unclear wow. as to whether gun control would have stopped this person, who clearly is either uh, either a terrorist or has mental health issues. I mean, he and his wife are in their twenties. They left a six-month-old child, a daughter, apparently. And, um, I, you know, it has to be thoroughly investigated, obviously. We don't know a lot of the answers. Uh, apparently, right. he was angry at people at work, but also uh, there's evidence of a lot of planning and premeditation with bombs and, and weapons and ammunition, et cetera. So um, my guess is it was a combination of a, of a terrorist act and uh, his, his acting out his anger at somebody at work. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, they showed a stat of how many people died in the last, uh, since 2012. I don't have it in front of me, but it was staggering, uh, the numbers. It was just unbelievable. So uh, I just uh, hope that this doesn't happen anymore. But, uh, well, I, do, we'll have to I, wait. Generally believe, I generally believe in gun control, you know, uh, up to a point. But on the other hand, you know, criminal elements who want to use guns to hurt people will get them. I firmly believe that. So the question is, are we better able to protect ourselves with lots of guns or with fewer guns? I tend to think that reasonable gun control is a better way. But there are two sides to every story. There's no question about that. Absolutely. Um, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the Chicago cop charged with a murder, but uh, let me play this sound for my audience, and then we'll talk on the other side. A veteran Chicago police officer has been charged with first-degree murder in the shooting death of a black teenager. Police say Officer Jason Van Dyke shot 17-year-old Laquan McDonald 
16 times in October of 2014. Soon to be released dash cam video is said to show Van Dyke jumping out of his cruiser and within seconds shooting McDonald. Police say McDonald was slashing tires with a knife and acting erratically when officers responded. Officer Van Dyke claimed McDonald lunged at him. A hallucinogenic drug was found in the teen's system at the time of his death. Van Dyke was placed on paid desk duty after the shooting. Today, a judge denied him bail. The video of the incident must be released by tomorrow. As a result, the city is bracing for major protests once the footage is seen. Defense attorney Nicole DeBoard is with us now from Houston. Uh, Nicole, you've represented police officers in similar situations before. Were you surprised at the first-degree murder charge? Really, I'm not. The reality is, is that police officers don't have a legal excuse, if you will, that allows them to shoot someone to death. What happens is that an average Joe really doesn't encounter a circumstance that would require the use of deadly force on an average day, but a police officer might get called into a situation where they would be required to use deadly force. The difference here is, is that obviously the grand jury and perhaps the DA believed that deadly force was not justified in this case. Officer Van Dyke was given no bail. What does that mean for his defense? Anytime you have a client who has been denied bail, it does make it more difficult to prepare the case. As a defense attorney, you're always going to rely on your client to be able to help you prepare the case, help you prepare a defense. None of that is going to happen outside the jailhouse while a client is in jail. It does make it more difficult. The dash cam video, Nicole, as you know, will be released tomorrow. How will that change the case? I think it really poses a difficult situation for both sides. Uh, the courtroom is where the decisions about who is guilty, who is not guilty, and whether conduct was justified under the law should be made. And when you release evidence out to the public, on the one hand, the public has the right to know. On the other hand, you have people forming opinions before the matter can be heard in court. And it's going to make it very difficult for them to pick a jury in the same area where this crime is said to have occurred um, because the information and the evidence is going to be out for people to form opinions about. Officer Van Dyke claimed that he feared for his life during the incident. So what will his attorney's strategies be? Uh, what will that be in explaining that? So what attorneys have to explain, what the defendant through his attorneys will have to explain, is that this was a rapidly evolving situation. And at some point during this rapidly evolving situation, this police officer felt that either himself or other police officers or citizens were in immediate danger of serious bodily injury or death. And that he had no choice but to intervene and use deadly force to stop the suspect. That's what they will be trying to show in the courtroom. All right. Nicole DeBoard in Houston for us. Nicole, thank you. Tom Mesereau, uh, defense attorney out of Los Angeles, what is your take on the latest uh, sh uh, shooting with this Chicago cop and the fact that he's charged with first-degree murder? I think the charge is very appropriate based on what I saw on television. I don't know any other facts other than what I saw on that tape, and what I saw made me sick to my stomach. I mean, this is a kid walking on the street, and a police officer put 16 shots in him. You know, let's suppose there was a legitimate threat at the beginning, which I don't think there was. Right. Let's suppose right. there was. You don't just put 16 bullets in him. He clearly wanted him dead. There's no doubt in my mind after seeing that tape. This police officer wanted this young fellow dead, and that's murder. And, but the conviction, with it's hard enough to get the conviction with cops, as, as you know, but from that standpoint, wouldn't have them uh, wouldn't they be better off going for the lesser charge, knowing uh, what history uh, shows us in terms of the uh, first degree from that standpoint? Well, well, police officers walk into courtrooms in America, generally speaking, with a presumption that they're innocent. You know, we're all right. supposed to have presumption, but most of us don't get it. But police officers really do get it. You know, there, there are mo many American citizens truly want to believe that the police are there to protect them, that the police are there to, to, to protect their families, to make their homes safe, to make their children safe, to make the elderly people safe. And that without police officers, we'd all be, you know, in, in real trouble. So, so many jurors want to believe the police officers in 
um, more so than, than than anyone else. I mean, there is what is called a presumption of innocence in, in a criminal courtroom. Judges instruct juries that everybody's presumed innocent until proven otherwise. But in many ways, it's a fiction because most jurors, when they walk into criminal courtrooms and see a defendant sitting there with his or her defense lawyer, see a prosecutor with either the FBI or the or the, the local investigators or the the DA with uh, with the local sheriffs or police, they assume somebody committed some crime. But not with police officers. They walk in with everybody hoping they can believe them. And nevertheless, um, when you see a tape like this and you see him effectively shoot someone who's walking away and then make sure that he finishes the job, which is what I saw on the tape, I don't know how the defense is going to really ex- explain that. They may put him on the stand. He may say, you didn't see what he did before he was taped. I don't know what they're going to come up with in this one. It looks to me like premeditated murder. Again, if you think the first shot was justified or the second shot was justified, it's pretty hard to justify the remaining, you know, 15, 14, 13 shots. Uh, he wanted him dead. And uh, just by looking at the video, that seems obvious to you, right? It does to me. But, again, I don't know anything more than what I saw on television. Uh, if there was some, t- some type of history or circumstances beyond the purview of the uh, of the camera, I'm not aware of them. What I saw is horrifying. Okay. Um, have you heard the uh, latest ruling in the Oscar Pistorius uh, situation? Yes, I have. And... Um, you know their legal system is very different than ours. I mean, we don't we, we don't live in a system where uh, the, the appellate court um, you know declares someone guilty of murder when in the trial court they were essentially acquitted of murder. That doesn't happen here. Um, right. But nevertheless, I'm not surprised given the politics surrounding the case, given the uh, the you know publicity the case generated around the world, uh, given the tragic consequences to Ms. Dean Camp's family, and given the fact that, you know, they focused on a statute which talks about foreseeability, the question being, was he able to foresee and did he foresee that whoever was on the other side of that door was going to die? And the answer, you know, according to the Court of Appeals was yes, it clearly was foreseeable and he definitely did foresee that somebody would die if he fired four shots into the bathroom. So I understand their reasoning. It's a different system than we have in America. Um, I tend to think that we have the best system, uh, the fairest system. It's far from perfect. It makes a lot of mistakes. Innocent people are convicted. Their families are put through torture and nightmare because innocent people are convicted. Uh, I know Michael Jackson was innocent, yet you never know what a jury would do. He could have been convicted. The media could have influenced people unjustifiably. So I believe we have the fairest system, (laughs) the best system, and defense attorneys have to fight for justice and fight for their clients every way they can within the canons of ethics and within the law. And if everybody does their job, the judge, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the jurors, the witnesses, who are under oath to uh, to tell the truth. If everyone does their job, I think our system works better than any other system, but it is filled with flaws. But nevertheless, you asked, am I surprised? No, I'm not, given what I read about, um, about uh, the way the system works in South Africa, given the publicity associated with the case, and given the fact that, you know, in the small confines of his house and room, it's hard to understand why he fired four shots into that bathroom. Um, right. Not- not knowing that his girlfriend was probably in there. Uh, it is, yeah. That that part has people scratching their head. I mean, that's the part you just can't, you know, you can't bring yourself to, uh, you know, something that would be normal. Well, I think the defense did a good job in showing that as a disabled man, he was vulnerable. Uh, he was yes. especially annoyed of being attacked or robbed. I think they did a good job of showing that the um, there's a very high crime rate in that area. A lot of burglaries, particularly uh, with homes that are thought to be uh, to house affluent people. Uh, it, it, I think the defense did a good job showing that he was paranoid about being a target because of his fame, his perceived wealth, um, 
his disability, and I understood all 